Well, it is 420 here in San Francisco, so you can imagine what it smells like in the street. Hi, everybody. Adam Savage here in my cave testing out a microphone. Um, so I guess I don't have to yell. Uh, and uh, I've just finished Aldo Rain's Knife from um, Inglorious Bastards, which will be a video that goes up maybe before this or maybe after. Um, but it's just sitting here so I can have it nearby. Um, I am taking questions from tested patrons today. I'm answering questions from tested patrons today. And uh, this one comes from David Griffiths. He says, I always appreciated your and Jamie's different approaches to problem solving and learned from both of them. Uh, he said, I thought Jamie's appreciation for your lead balloon build came through very clearly in the edit. What was your favorite build of Jamie's, awe-inspiring or terrifying or both? Yeah, I so, Lead Balloon was a really interesting progression. Uh, we, had, we had that idea and it was probably 18 months or more before we were able to execute that idea. Um, so when you think about producing a lead balloon, a lead balloon, the first thing you need is really thin lead. And the question is how thin? And I started to do the math on this and I started to think, well, look, if we're gonna make a lead balloon, we need to have a certain, we need to be able to encompass a certain area of helium. And so there is a minimum sort of liftability. And I, it was about adjusting all of these parameters. Like is the lead two thousandths of an inch thick or is it one thousandth of an inch thick? And in the end, after boiling through a whole bunch of different possibilities, right? Because there's, a, there's an absolute minimum size your balloon has to be for it to contain enough helium in order to be positively buoyant. And that was really like, don't get me wrong, from, a, from an experimental standpoint, all you really need to do is to tape out two squares of lead and fill them with air and you've made a lead balloon. But, that's not good enough. I think we can all agree it's got to float. And when we started to looking at it, started to look at it floating, I came up with the math that uh, if it was one thousandth of an inch thick, and the balloon was about ten feet in diameter, that would be just enough helium to be able to hold itself up. And so, in order to give ourselves some wiggle room, I think we made it. 12 or 14 feet on a side. Um, and in this early stages, Jamie was really skeptical. He was like, lead that thin is really awful to work with. And we had some samples that were three thousandths of an inch thick, which is maybe no, it was even thinner. It was two thousandths of an inch thick. But at two thousandths of an inch thick, the balloon would have to be ridiculously large. Like it would have to be like 19 feet in diameter. So I, it doesn't quite work out. I know the math is spheric, spherical volumes and stuff. Suffice to say, we had a sample that was like two, two and a half thou thick. And that was just not going to work in any circumstance that we felt confident we could get across the line. And we had ordered lead from two different factories in the U.S. And both of them said, yeah, we can, you know, normally they just keep rolling it and rolling it and rolling it thinner and thinner and thinner. And they said, yeah, we can, we normally do three or four thousandths of an inch thick for shielding inside of computer cases, but we can go a little further. And both of these companies, like months apart, broke their rollers trying to get that last they broke their machines or something went wrong and like we thought Monday we're gonna have some lead and Monday morning the company calls up and like, yeah, you're not getting any lead, we're, 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 yeah. So eventually at this point, Jamie is like complaining about the fact that it's, um, you know, lead is a terrible material to work with, it's totally to be fair. Uh, and he doesn't think it's going to work. And at some point in there, I was able to convince him that I had this idea that was going to work, right? We're going to make a cube and we're going to encompass this amount. I just needed it to be a thousandth of an inch thick. And um, to his credit, he got, he, I don't know if he got excited about it, but he, called, he, he was like, okay, I think I can find a place. And he found this place in Germany called Epstein Foils. Um, and Epstein foils, man, came through like nobody's business. They didn't deliver one thousandth of an inch thick lead. They decided in a classic Teutonic fashion to give us 60% of that. It was 70% of that. It was seven ten thousandths of an inch thick. 
30% thinner than one thousandth. Yeah. Um, and so once we found that and I figured out the cube construction, uh, Jamie was, Jamie was uh, appreciative and that was a delightful episode to execute because once he, once I had figured out that structure and the size, um, he jumped in with both feet and we started trying to prognosticate exactly how this thing was going to fail, the ways in which it was going to tear itself apart. The fact is when you take lead that's that thin and you crumple it and you uncrumple it, if you look at it, it's like a lace curtain. You can see all the way through it. That meant that we would have to take this lead off of these foil rolls and that would be the only operation we did. We'd bring it off and tape it together and bring it off and tape it together. And we had, I think it was like two foot, it was so much work to get this thing together. And th th it, that work was preceded by like a week and a half of me and Jamie just like really thinking through how this is gonna screw up and m coming up with methods for mitigating the ultimate failure of this balloon. And we succeeded, we succeeded. Uh, I'm really proud of that episode. I am even more proud of that episode because when we were turning out episodes full time, uh, we would first turn in an outline. You know, I'd work with our, our production team would work out an outline of how the episode would likely go. And then the edit team would be like, okay, we've got an episode coming in. Carrie, Grant and Tori are going to do this episode. Adam and Jamie are going to do this one. I think this is the A story and that's the B story. And you'd always try and figure out which was going to be the lead story because you're going to give it a little more cut time. And that, you know, alters how you're going to digitize the footage and what you're going to prioritize. And so Lead Balloon, absolutely in the outline phase, was the B story. And then we turned in the episode and the first cut came in at like 55 minutes just to get through all the narrative beats. And that was the episode that helped me understand that we could tell thrilling, beautiful stories that had no explosions, no guns, no fire, no bombast, just two dudes and a bunch of people helping trying to make a completely useless thing out of the worst material imaginable for it. Um, I do have a favorite, oh, I just touched my nose. I do have a favorite uh, Jamie solution, and there were so many over the years, uh, but <clears throat> underwater, uh, raising a boat with ping pong balls. That, so there was a, there was a myth, a story that it had been done, and then there was a Disney cartoon with Pluto or Goofy. Not sure I could tell you the difference right now between Pluto and Goofy. I know that makes me a bad Disneyite, but um, there was a comic book of a Disney comic book of raising a boat from that is sunken using only ping pong balls. And <clears throat> oh, yep, all right, uh, raising a boat with ping pong balls, and we started to ideate how to get tens of thousands of ping pong balls into a boat underwater. How do you drag them underwater? How do you take these buoyant things and push them into the water? And we sat there for like a day drawing the most elaborate devices using trash pumps, but they didn't quite work, using centrifugal force, using, um, we even at one point drew up a, a, a chain belt with little hooks on it that would pull them out of a hopper that we'd create on the, on the water's surface. And then, <clears throat> and then Jamie came up with the solution, which was to use uh, water pressure itself. Uh, <clears throat> and as he described it, look, if I take a pipe that is a mile long and I stick it into the ocean and I have this, the tip of that pipe just like a few inches above and I pour water into it, water's gonna come out the bottom. No matter how far down it is, it's, that's what water's gonna do. And so Jamie was like, well, if I pour water in that but also add ping pong balls, will the water pressure bring them down? And the answer was yes, times, times 30,000. Uh, we had 30,000 ping pong balls and amazingly, our production team, led at that point by Eric Haven, was the, I think, the lead uh, producer on that. He managed to get us permission <clears throat> to sink a boat in Monterey Bay, a protected wildlife sanctuary. We had to clean it within an inch of its life and scrape all the paint off, et cetera. 
But once we had done that and made sure it had no dirty things on it, they allowed us to sink that in Monterey Bay off the end of a dock, and then we got 30,000 ping pong balls. I built this giant conical hopper out of clear plastic and welded steel. We filled it full of ping pong balls, and we started using a fire hose to get a, to get a whirlpool going, and lo, just ping pong balls started shooting out the bottom. It was totally amazing. Um, that's one of those... That's one of those things where, like, here are Jamie and I spending a whole day going back and forth in front of a whiteboard, coming up with different ideas for getting, some, getting ping pong balls down to the bottom of, you know, 40 feet down below the surface. And then Jamie's like, well, what about just waterhead? What about the, the old pressure of water? And I say, oh, yeah. Uh, wow, let's, let's see if it works. So we took a 55-gallon drum, and we took a pipe, and we took it to the top of M5, which is about... 27 feet high, 30 feet high, and, and it worked. Um, that's one of those things of like, we like to say that we would argue vigorously over various ways to execute an idea. But the fact was, was that when the right idea showed up in the room, it was always apparent. It was always obvious that that was the right idea. And then it's just time to abandon all of your other preconceptions because, well, that's the simplest, the cheapest, the fastest. It requires no moving parts except for water. Uh, and I was delighted to give up all of the things I'd been fighting for all day, you know, because there's no point to fighting anymore once you've heard the right solution. This is, I use this as an example of, uh, of the ethos of how we made the show. Um, and that infused us and also our whole team, which is like, you know, work hard to ideate, fight for your ideas and really, you know, make sure that they survive that fight. But when the right idea shows up, give up everything because there's no point to, there's no point to argue. There's nothing more boring to me than arguing with somebody because they want their, their idea to be the one that gets used. They want the credit who cares? I, you know, frankly, I tell you, there's many solutions that we came up with on Mythbusters that I'm not sure either Jamie nor I could tell you whose idea it was. Um, yeah, that was a good one. One funny story about filming in Monterey Bay. Uh, we had to have, uh, we had a, a wildlife expert consultant in a kayak on the shoot to make sure that otters weren't going to get harmed because the otters are the apex, I believe they are, the, one of the apex predators of the Monterey Bay watershed. Um, they are super important to the watershed. Um, you got to look into it because it's totally amazing. The, in, the reintroduction and revivification of the population of otters in Monterey Bay has substantively changed the ecosystem because they eat the urchin, the sea urchins that would kill the kelp forests that allow all these other amazing things to happen in Monterey Bay. Um, so, as such, uh, there are very specific and important restrictions to interacting with otters in the wild. And we had a wildlife expert there to help make sure that we were holding to that. Um, and what we did not count on is how playful otters are and how much it turns out that this one otter we met loved ping pong balls. And the otter kept on going and grabbing the ping pong balls and like had this little stash of them. And the wildlife guys like, you know, it's, we don't want the otter to choke. The, uh, the idea of an otter choking on a ping pong ball is like our worst freaking nightmare. So we work hard to separate the ping pong balls. We had oil booms all around the site so that ping pong balls didn't get away and not a single ping pong ball got away, I'm proud to say. But there was this point at which the otter had been successfully separated from all the surface ping pong balls. And at this point, the otter realized that the source was down at the bottom. So at one point, Jamie is in scuba gear on the bottom of Monterey Bay, about 40 feet below the surface, and he is swimming down with the fire hose to add more ping pong balls to the boat. And as he gets to the port in the boat, this otter swims out, the one we've been dealing with, and he's holding on to two ping pong balls and he's got one in his mouth. And he swims up and he sees Jamie and he goes, oh, and the ping pong ball leaves his mouth and he swims away. And Jamie comes up laughing hysterically, which is not common, um, and describing the scene. We didn't get it on camera. It's still like one of my favorite mental images from the shooting of Mythbusters. 
That was a lovely question. Thank you for asking. Um, <clears throat> You're not always going to work with people that you like. Jamie and I were not friends, not friendly even, really. We never had a meal alone together. But boy, making stuff together, that was real special. Um, I like telling stories from that time. Um, David Griffiths, thank you for that excellent question. Tested patrons, if you'd like to become a tested patron and give us more support, we'd appreciate that. Um, the instructions are in the uh, uh, description. And uh, keep submitting your questions, and I'll keep answering them. Thank you, guys. I'll see you next time.